with the increasing adoption of machine learning models and systems in high stake settings across different industries guaranteeing a model's performance after deployment has become crucial monitoring models in production is a critical need of ensuring this continued performance and reliability today we will learn more about amazon sage maker model monitor a fully managed service that continuously monitors the quality of machine learning models hosted on amazon sage maker so uh before we proceed uh just a little bit about us and our speakers of the day walking tree technologies boasts of a team of over 300 engineers and designers with a core focus on designing and building cross platform web and mobile applications perform system integrations and enable digital transformation we offer solutions across the entire software development life cycle a little bit about our speakers now scott is our cto and comes with an experience of over 30 years in engineering enterprise computing systems these include many years of cloud computing experience with public and private cloud architectures he is also helping our clients bootstrap their aws strategy for accelerated global growth abhilasha has a total experience of 17 years and her core exp uh, core strength lies in designing and building cross uh, platform applications She's also been working with our clients to leverage the AWS platform to enable them to scale and succeed globally. Shubham has been with us for almost five years now. His core strength lies in DevOps, analytics, AI, and machine learning. He's helped clients save thousands while moving into AWS and embrace innovation at a competitive pace. All three of our speakers come with years of experience in machine learning and have extensively worked towards enabling organizations. across the world from diverse industries to transform their business processes to intelligent autonomous operations by delivering machine learning services and consultation from cloud to edge before passing on the screen to scott i'd like to mention a few things your questions are very welcome please put them up in the q and a section and we'll go through them at the end of our session secondly the session is recorded and we will be sharing the recording with every one of you as well as all those who have registered for this event lastly if you still have any questions please reach out to us on connect@walkingtree.tech or through our website i believe that's all from my side uh, scott will take over from here over to you scott okay thank you uh, very much prenshu Uh, so what I'm going to open up with is just to talk a little bit about what uh, what is model monitoring and why do we need it. So before we really get into that, though, I want to take a step back to our last webinar on ML ops, and I shared this little diagram, and you know, part of this uh, is. Uh, is indeed in telling what we're going to talk about today. So if we look at the journey, right, for uh your you know deploying your uh machine learning um models out into production. So you've you've gone through all your case studies, you've done your data engineering, you created your machine learning pipelines, you deployed to production and everything is great, right? So the model is just as you predicted, no issues at all. and then all of a sudden you get a dose of reality and realize that it's not quite uh what was in the lab so what that kind of brings the need of is this concept of monitoring right so and in this diagram you know that's the reason we have it there is that we want to constantly model uh, monitor those models to look for for different things happening to to our models because we know that real life versus what's in the lab is uh, it can be quite different So what is model monitoring? Uh well, model monitoring is a really a what I would say a series of techniques uh deployed to really measure your model performance metrics and really to understand issues when they arise. So, you know, kind of areas like model drift, model performance, the data quality, and what monitoring is going to do is allow your uh, ML engineers to really quickly detect and determine 
where they need to go to, to further analyze the uh, root cause. And when you think about some of these, these issues, right, uh, we'll talk about the different types of, of, and the concept of drift in a moment, but just kind of think about some of the things that may have, may have hit companies in the last two years, right? So, you know, we're still living through COVID, but imagine, uh, you know, things like you, de you developed your model for facial recognition, right? And all of a sudden, now everyone's wearing masks. So guess what? You're facial recognition is no longer working. So you have to adapt to that, right? To be able to do facial recognition while also recognizing that people may be wearing a mask. So you have to adapt. <clears throat> and, you know, one of the, uh, I, I guess, more uh, comical uh, things of this, if we can say that uh, comical, that nothing, nothing about COVID was comical, right? But I look back and I look at 2020 and I look at what happened when COVID hit and this graph in the middle, right? And, and this is showing the paper towel rush. Well, there was also a toilet paper rush too, right? So let's just be honest. There, was, there were times when, you know, when COVID first hit, you couldn't get a, 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 a not even a roll of toilet paper in the U.S. for a while. And, and I'm sure globally as well. But imagine that you are a manufacturer of these paper goods and all of a sudden you see this exponential uh, demand for your product. So how do you adapt to that, right? And and in your machine learning, uh, in your models, really, how could you ever predict that that's the case, right? Maybe you could, really couldn't, but monitoring kind of gives us some indicators that that's going to happen to let us know that we need to make some kind of change. So that certainly is an extreme example, but hey, you know, like the slogan says, life happens. So we have to be able to adapt to it. And that's the same for our models. We have to kind of get over the fact that, you know, we, we don't just create a model and it's done and it's good for eternity. Uh, that model has to be monitored and it may have to be adapted to, to real world things. And, and you know, the, another example is you've got a, an autonomous vehicle, for instance, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's something you didn't recognize, right? You're trying to, to come up with object recognition and those kind of things. I mean, there's all kind of things that are always occurring that maybe you need to adapt to. So that's kind of when we look at that, you know, this real life thing that happens really, uh, really needs. Uh, uh, we really need assistance in terms of our uh, let me go back. Sorry, went one too many. So. Again, why do we need it? We talk, talked about some of those reasons, but you know, machine learning models really are, are generally developed using really carefully curated data sets, and they're tested equally on, on those equally clean data sets. But as we talked about, the nature of data they get in production can be very different uh, statistically and can really lead to unexpected uh, results uh, or predictions in those models. And, you know, some of the things that can impact that uh, are conditions, right? The conditions in which the data is collected can change. Uh, that results in a change in the nature of the data itself. Uh, the other thing is statistical distribution, right? Uh, statistical distribution data used to train a model may, be, may change drastically over time. And that can, of course, later on result in model bias. Uh, the other thing is systematic flaws, right? A systematic flaw in data collection and labeling will uh, will lead to undesired results, right? So uh, we, we have to think about things like data collected through instruments or through sensors. Well, those sensors, maybe we deployed a sensor into an environment that we never counted on that sensor, uh, you know, hitting increased temperatures or, or or, or some kind of other extreme condition, right? So it could cause that sensor to drift a little bit even. So we have to be able to recognize those things and adapt to them. And, and the other areas, maybe there's just some new data out there that we didn't know about. So we have to be able to know that that happens, right? So the monitoring will let us do that, allow us to do that and, and give that information that's needed to the uh, ML engineers. So. When we talk about all those things, those things really culminate and result in model drift, what we call model drift, right? And that model drift occurs when the relationship between features and labels is no longer valid due to the learned relationship patterns changing over time. 
Well, and there, there's different types of drift, right? So there's the gradual drift. And sorry, if you look at my diagram, I realize that curve is, well, not, not, so, not so gradual. But, uh, but that, the point being, hey, gradual means this really is the most common type of model drift. And it, it really happens as a result of the natural consequences of uh, your, maybe your business, lamp, your business landscape is, uh, is constantly changing. It's dynamic. It's evolving over time. So it may be gradual drift, right? But having monitoring in place will allow us to recognize that and then, uh, then adapt our model to that. Well, the next kind of drift is, uh, I, uh, I put this diagram of the, the deer in the middle of the road. I, I live in, you know, the, the uh, foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the southeastern United States. And one of the things that we have to deal with when we're driving at night, especially, is deer. And they just seem to be very attracted to headlights. So that deer comes out. Bam, all of a sudden we're having to figure out what we need to do, slam on our brakes, anything we can do to avoid that deer, right? But we have to, it's an instant change for us, so we have to adapt to that. So a lot of things like that can happen, right? So when this happens, there's a sudden drop in model performance over time. It, it could be a, a defect in the data pipeline that causes data quality issues or it uh, the model being deployed in a new domain or, or other outlier events, right? Like uh, COVID or, or even, you know, the things we, we don't necessarily realize is even the kind of crisis going on in, the, in Ukraine right now can affect some of those models. So we have to always be ready uh, to recognize that those things are, uh, are happening. And that's why mo you know, monitoring is so important. So instantaneous uh, the instantaneous model drift is uh, is uh, is another type of, of of model drift, and then we've got the recurring uh, model drift. And the recurring model drift is a result of like seasonal events that have some periodicity, and you know, and are recurring over a set period of time. So so we know those patterns, and, and really they can be forecasted. And you know, think about this: it could be due to you know, to the holidays, or maybe we've got some yearly promotion that always happens, but it's something that, that we can know about and that we can forecast and, and make sure that our models adapt to that when that time comes. Uh, the last type of, uh, of model drift I'll talk about is a, a temporary, right? So just like, you know, it, on a rainy day, the, the, the roads are wet. Well, that may just be for that day. And then by the night, time the night comes, it could be the pavement could be dry again, right? So, temporary uh, drift is really happening due to some strange or one-off event. It could be cyber attacks. It could be that clients are using the product in a way that you never intended or or never thought they ever would, right? And uh, also, it could be new new clients coming onto the platform, or you could have you know system per temporary system performance issues. So yeah, all of those are great, right? It's good that we can know the importance of monitoring. And really the next thing we have to do is really look at, well, how do we address that, right? And that comes into where uh, we, we need to look at different approaches on how to uh, address monitoring. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Abilasha to talk about. Abilasha, it's uh, all yours. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, so, as we understood, like what, uh, what, why we need a model monitoring. Now we have to look at uh, the approaches, uh, how we can do model monitoring. So basically on a high level, when we speak about it, we can either do it manually or we use a managed service for it. Now, if you are doing a, a manual uh, model monitoring, so in this case, uh, like all the steps would have to be manually implemented by the MLOps engineers themselves. So you would be capturing the data which is received by the models in order to be able to uh, check uh, or perform the uh, analysis on top of the data by comparing the data received 
with your uh, training data set, then uh, there will be rules defined to detect the uh, drift or any uh, violations or uh, drop in the uh, accuracy of the models. And then sending alerts if this if any of these uh, drifts are detected. So basically, all the all the steps would remain the same, but in a manual mode, uh, you would have to manually perform these steps. And where so uh, with that comes the challenge of uh, a manual uh, task. So if if the process is being done manually, so you have a dependency on the. Uh, person's expertise, like the you need the MLOps engineering expertise. Then again, since it's a manual process, it uh, it would vary from the person who is doing it or uh, the availability of time. And then there could be a deviation from best practices. Since you're not imposing uh, certain specific uh, uh, methodologies to perform it, it may deviate based on the person who's uh, performing the model monitoring. Also, now if there's any change in or in any update in the model, so you'll have to relook and uh, update or uh, repeat the steps of your monitoring. And finally, like you would not want to spend more effort and energy on your model monitoring because that is not where your real value creation is. You would rather focus on what value you, or what results your model is uh, giving you. But then in this scenario, you have to uh, manually keep monitoring your model to ensure the correctness of your uh, model results. So that is why uh, we look at uh, approaches of a more managed or an automated uh, solution to handle the mo model monitoring. And uh, Amazon uh, uh, SageMaker is a fully managed service, which actually removes this uh, heavy lifting for each of the ML uh, steps. And definitely we have something for the model monitoring as well. So we have the Amazon SageMaker model monitor, which is a fully managed automatic monitoring uh, service uh, where uh, you can actually capture your data. You can uh, set up your, uh, you can decide what kind of data you want to monitor and analyze. You can perform the built-in analysis in the form of rules, uh, which you can set up. And then based on the rules, the drifts will be detected in the data and the model quality. And uh, these metrics, you can actually emit uh, these metrics to Amazon CloudWatch. So based on that, you can have notifications being sent, alarms being triggered, or you can as well uh, like uh, initiate corrective actions like if you want to retrain your data or sorry retain your model or if you want to make changes to your data so you can actually automate the entire process because this is what is actually the real life cycle of a model when it goes into production and you're monitoring its performance so this entire thing you can actually uh, automate it here and you can schedule the monitoring jobs so that you don't have to like uh, do it regularly, but you can uh, have some scheduled timelines of when you want to uh, monitor and compare the results. Also, since you have these metrics uh, emitted to CloudWatch, you can actually integrate this with other visualization tools like uh, QuickSight and uh, Tableau, Sensor, uh, TensorBoard, etc and build your uh, dashboards and reports on top of the metrics to get a complete view of how the drifts are happening and what data is causing uh, the drifts. So uh, the visual visualization of this uh, can also be uh, uh, achieved in this. Also, additionally, there's another uh, service uh, in the SageMaker uh, ecosystem, which is Clarify, which actually uh, specifically helps to improve visibility in uh, the case of a bias. So if there is a potential bias, you can further investigate using the Clarify, which is integrated with your uh, model monitor. Also, with all this ecosystem in Amazon, you can uh, be rest assured about the security of your data. You can uh, encrypt your data if you need additional security. And then you have your data retention policies 
access control mechanisms for the secure as access of the data because most of this data is when you're saving it you're saving it in s3 so all this you can apply on top of the data uh, now coming to uh, what are the types of monitoring which are provided by uh, amazon model monitor uh, so there are four main types and each of these types are actually dependent on the type of drift we, which we are trying to detect and monitor. So that's the reason there is a, like the high level process remains the same where you capture uh, the data, you define your baseline and then you set up your rules and based on the rules, if uh, you have a continuous monitoring of your uh, models and uh, whenever there's a drift, then uh, you will have your alarms or triggers to take the necessary action. But then depending on the type of the uh, drift or the type of the issue which you want to detect, so there are four uh, um, types here. So data quality monitoring, model quality monitoring, model bias monitoring, and finally feature attribution drift monitoring. So if we look into the first one, the data quality monitoring, as the name suggests, so this is related to the quality of data. So uh, so we know like whenever there is a machine learning model, so there will be some model inputs, uh, which we also call the independent variables or the features based on which we uh, generate the output or the dependent variable. Now, uh, there could be a drift in either the input or the output also, depending on uh, different situations. So uh, for example, uh, like if the inputs are uh, uh, like expected to be in a specific range, uh, it may be required to be non-negative, it should be not null, but then due to various reasons, uh, like because of the real-time challenges or uh, the real-time scenario of collection, uh, data collection, it is possible that some of these uh, data quality issues arise, which are, um, which will cause uh, in uh, like a non uh, like uh, drift in your uh, data model uh, predictions. Uh, now uh, also now this is from the input perspective. Again, uh, if uh, like if there are sensors which are actually uh, providing this data now with uh, the sensors could age or there could be issue with the sensors because of which it could give some invalid values. So we should be able uh, to detect those values and uh, obviously we don't want to do it manually. So we would set up the thresholds or uh, rules for uh, the values so that if there's any such scenario, then that is um, highlighted and uh, taken care of. Uh, also on the output side, also same, same case may arise. So if, because uh, due to uh, any uh, reason, any issues with the input data, if the output is also uh, going haywire and you're getting a, like for example, uh, in a summer day temperature recommendation, you get something like a over 60 degree Celsius, which is not even a valid value. So obviously you should have a threshold of what uh, is possible so that any such uh, violations are detected and then you uh, issue alerts. Now coming to the second uh, type, the model quality monitoring. So this is related to uh, the, uh, like the performance of the model. Now this would uh, be evaluated based on certain metrics like, uh, uh, so depending on the type of the model, the metrics will also vary. So if it is a regression, so you have metrics like mean square error. If it is a bin binary uh, classification, so you have precision recall. So these are different uh, metrics which you usually uh, would use to evaluate your uh, model performance. Now you would uh, set these metrics and you would set the thresholds for these metrics, which would be uh, based on your assessment when you were training your model and the type of uh, data you're expecting. And then if there is any a violation of the threshold, then that would be detected as a model quality issue and uh, it would be uh, like triggered uh, appropriately by the model, uh, monitor, model quality monitor. So when you are actually setting up, there will be a difference in how you uh, set up the model quality monitoring in your model monitor. 
so for example an email uh, spam detection case now if your precision is falling below your threshold and uh, like oh, oh, most of your emails are going into spam for example so that is a that is a very visible degradation of your model performance and that needs to be looked into Im uh, immediately uh, the third uh, type is the model bias uh, monitoring so as uh, like as we know like bias is something when uh, it usually happens when you are actually uh, your uh, trained training data is different from your live data what you are actually getting when you deploy your model so then uh, mostly then the bias may be introduced and uh, that would definitely give you inaccurate results which need to be highlighted again so um, an example of bias could be like if you're using an algorithm which is actually trained using english names and now you are trying to uh, run the model for indian names so obviously it will not be able to identify the names correctly and it the names would be rejected so um, that is a case of a bias which needs to be uh, like uh, immediately catered to so high uh, alert should be raised and the model should be uh, retrained with proper data uh, another example could be like now for example if you are processing lo loan requests and uh, you have trained your model with uh, a medium age group uh, kind of uh, data set but now if your real data you are getting uh, old age and young age uh, people so again that would result in bias so uh, depending on the like the different uh, demographics race color gender class of how the uh, data is uh, segregated that could result in a bias in your model predictions and uh, that would uh, be detected in the model and then alerts would be uh, sent uh, finally the last uh, type of model monitoring the feature attribution uh, monitoring so the feature attribution uh, bias is uh, related to the different features which uh, which you use to come up with your model output so the different features may have a uh, different impact on the output now initially when you trained your model so a specific feature was more important but then as uh, as the model is in production there may be some changes in the way uh, in the relationship between the data or any external factors also could introduce that uh, change where a different feature could become more important and uh, the current feature could lose its importance so there is a shift in the feature attribution or the importance of the feature which needs to be again uh, identified and uh, uh, taken care of so uh, here uh, there is an example where uh, uh, like prior to uh, geo's entry in 2016 it was uh, the call rates which was more important when you when you are trying to uh, like predict customer retention for a telecom industry so call rates was one of the features which was considered as more important but then uh, later on uh the data rates became a more important feature so that's how now then you would have to retrain your model appropriately to uh, handle this case so as you are uh, automatically uh, monitoring these kind of uh, drifts you would be able to do that by appropriately setting up your uh, uh, pipeline your uh, uh, your uh, uh, statistic violation uh, metrics and rules based on which your model will be able to your model monitor will be able to uh, detect and then issue alerts so um, with this uh, we would now go into the details of how each of these uh, um, moni uh, monitor modeling is done in uh, aws uh, mon model monitor so uh, shubham will be taking over uh, and going going over this in more detail uh, over to you shubham
Thanks, Abhilasha. So hi, everyone. I'll be taking up the next section, which is orchestrating pipelines and scheduling jobs using model monitor. And in this, I'll discuss how the different types of monitoring, be it model quality monitoring, model data monitoring, model bias monitoring, and monitoring feature attribution can be done. Please give me a minute. Thanks. So, let's start with, I'll be sharing my own screen. So before I start, uh, let me mention that there are two ways in which the exercise can be done. As with most of the things in AWS MLOps, we have two important ways of implementing our solutions. One is what is known as the workload orchestrator. As you see, the workload orchestrator, which is specified as the second option here, is actually AWS solutions implementation for MLOps. It is a tool which gives you an option to configure and get the kind of pipeline you want. So if you want to have a model uh, deployment pipeline or an image creation pipeline or a model monitoring pipeline, you can just go to the orchestrator, specify the options and have that pipeline configured and orchestrated for you. The other is the more fine-tuned case whereby you use Python SDK, the SageMaker Python SDK for provisioning different kinds of pipelines and configuring your model monitor. Let me start with the first case, which is that of data quality monitoring. When we have to monitor the data, which is received, uh, received by our models in production, we need to follow four steps. The first step is naturally, we need to capture the real-time data, the real-time inference data, which is coming to SageMaker endpoints. We need to evolve some statistics and constraints based on that baseline data set. We need to see what are the constraints that that data set follows, what are the values, what are the data types, which the features in the data set uh, should lie within. Once we do that, we need to have a monitoring schedule created for the same so that whenever new data hits the model, we analyze the data and we see whether that data matches with the constraints which have been calculated by us uh, in consonance with the baseline data. Once the monitoring schedule has been created, we analyze the data quality issues and based on the data quality issues, alerts can be configured uh, via CloudWatch and based on the alerts received, we can take appropriate actions, for example, model retraining or fixing our upstream processes. Let me discuss this further. The first way of implementing this is using SageMaker Python SDK. Why I'm point, uh, referring this as first is because it gives you more flexibility while doing the implementation. So to be able to capture the real-time data from your SageMaker endpoints, we got to use the SageMaker.model monitor uh, module. And from that, we need to import the data capture config facility. With this, we need to enable the data capture option naturally. We can specify a sampling percentage of our choice. And most importantly, we need to specify the destination where the captured data, the data which is hitting the model, will be stored. This location will be an S3 location where the model monitor will read it from. Having done that, 
it's the time to deploy a model with this specific configuration. Once we do that, the next step is to evolve a baseline uh, or training data set related set of statistics and constraints, whereby we understand, we realize what constraints and stats our features will follow, are expected to follow, even when new data is coming into production. For that, we import the default model monitor and data set format and invoke the default model monitor via the role which we are using. We specify how many instances we want the model monitor to run on. We specify the instance type, the volume size in GB and the maximum run time uh, for which the model monitor may run. Then the most important thing is generation of the constraints and stats. Now this is something which is a service provided by model monitor. This is something which we, I, you don't have to do. And that's the best part of it. So you just specify your baseline data set, your training data set, as data set with header and specify the kind of format it is in and then invoke this job. My, mod, my monitor dot latest baseline link job. And when you do that, the output of the job will be in the form of baseline statistics and suggested constraints. Now, let me talk about what kind of statistics are these. Essentially, what we get is a statistics.json file, which stores values uh, per column, per feature, which are generated by pre-built uh, containers. You and I don't do anything here. It's pre-built containers running on SageMaker, which generate this file, which generate the per feature column constraint. This is calculated for baseline data set and also for the data set, which is being analyzed. Naturally, if you want to see whether your data, incoming data is drifting from the data, which is already uh, with which the model was trained, you need to have stats generated for both. This is done using a KLL sketch, which is a uh, compact pointers sketch. In this, what they do, they look at the entire data set for each feature, they analyze uh, all the records and divide it into 10 buckets, which are your quantiles. And this is as of now something which is not configurable. Uh, this is fixed by SageMaker model monitor. Now this has to be done both for the baseline data and for the live data. And uh, let me show how this looks for uh, a use case, which we have considered. So for the purpose of this demo, we have considered two use cases. Both of those use cases are related to FinTech. So FinTech uh, is uh, the domain where we actually work from the AIML perspective. So when FinTech is one of the most important domains where we do most of our work from AIML perspective, another is health tech, but the example which I will be taking is from FinTech. So the example which I will be considering is that of telecom customer retention. Of course, each one of us at some point of time or the other, we are indeed interested in exploring different plans provided by different operators. And quite often we do switch plans. So telecom companies are indeed interested in knowing what features drive customer retention, how to retain customers. And of course, what features would drive customer churn. So if you see here, I show you two data sets, a uh, set of data sets. One is coming from baseline and the other is coming from live data. This is for data monitoring. The first one is a statistics.json. The statistics.json is computed for uh, the features which are relevant for the customer retention case. So some of those features which are relevant uh, on which this model has been trained include your uh, account length, which means for how long your account is active, with the telecom operator. Now this, for example, shows uh, the number of values which are actually present in your data set for that, the number of missing values, the mean of those values, some standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and then shows the distribution, the quantiles as I was talking about. So your entire stretch is divided into 10 quantiles. And then what is the lower bound and upper bound of each quantile and the count of values there. Now this is a statistics which you get for your input data. And similarly, you have a constraint associated with each feature. So each feature will have certain attributes. You will see uh, what kind of uh, uh, values are allowed, whether negative values are allowed or uh, whether null values are allowed. So what you see is completeness here. Completeness essentially means the percentage of null values. Uh, so, or non-null values rather. So if completeness is one, it means there's a feature which will not accept null values. So when you send your model to production, the model sees live data. 
and based on the statistics generated again by using the same uh, library uh, which is actually deku which is used by state maker model monitor your constraints are evaluated against the baseline and based on that evaluation of both statistics and constraints a violations report is generated so i'll show the violations report for this case what it shows is uh, for the data which was received by the model so this is test data which was sent for uh, bringing these files out for generating these files creating all kinds of scenarios so in this particular case there has been an issue with the data type so the model uh, uh, has received data which is of different type than what is expected in this case if the values of some features were above uh, say uh, the normal expected values if the mean for example was way higher than the expected mean was and so on for other values those would as well be thrown as constraints and violations violations of the constraints once we see uh, the constraints which are associated and the statistics which are associated with our baseline data to be able to see what is happening with actual data to be able to generate those real time results we naturally got to have a monitoring schedule created which can be created by using the con cron expression generator from the sage maker model monitor uh, class and for, to be able to create this we need to specify the name for monitoring schedule naturally we need to specify the predictor endpoint uh the baseline statistics baseline constraints and then how frequently we want this job to run once that is done the uh, the respective results which i was showing to you they are generated and stored in the s3 bucket which is specified for the same so as i was mentioning the violations are in terms of a completeness check a baseline drift check a missing column check an extra column check a categorical value check and uh as described here so a data type check is essentially when the data type in execution differs from that in baseline data set a completeness check is one where the percentage of non nil items observed in production is different from what is specified in threshold uh, sorry in from baseline data a baseline drift check is when the calculated distribution and distance between current and baseline data sets is greater than the threshold specifying uh, specified in the monitoring config similarly if you have some columns which are missing in the data which is coming in production or we have some extra column data as well need to be specified and uh, we have values uh, for our models certain features are categorical features they have certain specified distinct values for example gender as male and female so if you are getting more unknown values in the current data set in baseline that needs to be thrown as a violation from the categorical values check perspective now we did this exercise using the python sage maker uh SDK. The same exercise can be done via a model uh, MLOps workload orchestrator. MLOps workload orchestrator was something which was discussed by us extensively in our last webinar. I won't be going to the details of it, but suffice this to mention: the workload orchestrator allows us to define our parameters, the kind of pipeline we want, and uh, the kind of deployment we want, real-time uh, batch inference, and the type of algorithm we want to choose for our model. And once we generate this JSON with the respective options and Uh, do a call api call make an api call to the workload generator to the workload orchestrator it generates a pipeline once we have generated a model uh, deployment pipeline which specifies the endpoint where data has to be captured once the model is in production the next thing we need to do is to specify a data quality pipeline now you see the difference here in this case you don't get to follow all the steps which you have followed before you only need to specify that you want a boim bring your own model data quality monitor pipeline you need to specify the endpoint name you need to specify the baseline a uh, data set naturally that is what you do earlier as well you need to specify the data capture location you need to specify for how uh, well at what interval your job will be running the instance type and the maximum run time and minimum uh, monitor max run time baseline uh, max run time settings once you do that and make an api call to the uh, workload orchestrator it will automatically generate this pipeline for you without you having to take any uh, other step from your side next i come to model quality monitoring and again we have the same set of steps whereby we create a model quality baseline first have some model quality metrics calculated 
schedule a monitor, uh, schedule a model monitoring job. So in first case, you have a baseline model uh, quality metrics calculated, and we will schedule a model monitoring job. We'll have ground truth labels uh, ingested and merged uh, with predictions. Naturally, if you want to mon monitor the quality of your model, how is your model performing in production? For the data which is coming in production, you need to have some labels. So you can only say whether your model is performing good or bad only when you have the actual results available with you. Your model was trained in lab on one kind of data set. Now it's going to production. A new kind of data is coming, but to be able to gauge accuracy on that kind of data set, you still need to have labels. Once you do that, uh, you have a model quality metrics available with you in production. And then uh, you can configure CloudWatch to send alerts based on these model quality metrics. Again, this can be done both by using SageMaker Python SDK, whereby you invoke the model monitor, uh, SageMaker model monitor. From there, you invoke the model quality monitor. And with the role which uh, you're running, with the number of instances you want, the instance type, volume size, maximum runtime, and SageMaker session, you launch the model quality monitor. And when you do that, uh, you have the option to create a baseline. So you have to create a baseline essentially based on the data which is available with you. And this is the data which was used to train the model. So uh, because you are measuring model performance, you are interested in some key metrics. It depends on your problem type as Ablasha was mentioning. So if you are working on a regression problem, you would be interested in mean squared error. Uh, uh, if you are interested in a classification problem, you would be interested in something like precision recall, f score, AUC and so on. So you specify the problem type you are working on the kind of inference attribute and probability attribute you're interested in, the label, the ground truth label, which is specified in your data set, the header, which is specified for, uh, well, as, as the end result of your, uh, uh, as output of your machine learning algorithm. And uh, once you run this job, this generates matrices, which you can view uh, in terms of constraints. So uh, it generates baseline uh, matrices and constraints, matrix and constraints, and, uh, then when you take the model to production, uh, once, once you've deployed the model, you will create an endpoint input to it. Uh, again, as before, you will create a model monitoring schedule, whereby you will take this endpoint input, which uh, will take the data which is coming from your model. You'll specify the problem type. Most of the steps are as, uh, as same as earlier, just that you need to, because it's uh, a case of measuring model performance, you need to specify the kind of problem you're working on. This is a binary classification problem. It could be a regression problem. It could be a multi-classification problem. You need to specify the ground truth, which is which essentially will measure, uh, will, will give you a baseline against which to compare the results produced by a model. You need to specify at what frequency your model will run. And then uh, you will, uh, for you, a violations report will be generated, which you can see. Now, uh, the same thing can be done via a workload orchestrator, where again, you specify just the kind of pipeline you're interested in and other necessary details, including your ground truth label, and this will uh, automatically launch that pipeline for you. Now, as before, uh, we have <clears throat> for this uh, telecom customer retention uh, case, we had a model in which uh, we had certain expectations regarding the accuracy and so on. Uh, I'll be showing that. So this is our uh, quality monitoring uh, and we have the baselines shown here in terms of stats and uh, uh, the constraints. So for example, uh, from the baseline, which is there, we expect the values of recall and precision and accuracy and recall best uh, uh, constant classifier and so on, AUC true positive rate and so on, they will actually be uh, around uh, the values specified here. They'll be within this range. Uh, and then so they will be actually, uh, 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 they will lie within certain constraints, within certain boundaries, uh, within cert uh, they will follow certain uh, thresholds. Uh, which are specified in the constraints file, but when you launch your monitoring schedule, your incoming data comes, then your live uh, scenario may be quite different. And we have violations generated accordingly. For example, for certain matrices, your uh, the actual value may be less than the threshold which is specified. For certain other matrices, that may be more than the value which is uh, specified. So as Abhilasha was mentioning, uh, it depends on the situation. So if you have a model which is classifying your emails as spam, so it's quite important for you to see that no actual mail gets listed as spam. That's quite important. In other case, uh, where you have a fraud detection system, it's quite important to see that no fraud transaction is missed out. So that depends on the kind of cases which you're interested in. And uh, this model quality pipeline provided by the SageMaker model monitor will actually, uh, depending on the kind of problem you have, will take the respective option. Next, we have uh, model bias monitoring. And uh, again, we have the same set of steps which include taking the uh, data from your SageMaker endpoints, creating a bias drift pipeline, scheduling monitoring jobs, and inspecting reports, 
The same can be done by using Python SDK, where you invoke the model bias monitor, specify the data config, the validation data set. So uh, what happens in case of bias, uh, as Ablasha mentioned earlier, the data on which your model is trained uh, is, could be quite different from the data that the model receives in production. So your model will, you will have an NLP model which was trained on an English data set, but you have started applying to that model to the Indian scenario. And now you have a very different set of results. So the values which you are getting, they are totally unexpected. So your actual entities are not being detected. For that, you need to have a data set created against which uh, the baseline will be done. The data set needs to be provided uh, as a data config. And you need to specify, uh, very importantly, you need to specify a particular for each feature, uh, the kind of bias you're interested in. So what will happen? Uh, uh, for each kind of feature which you are uh, which your uh, model is trained on so you have a whole set of features in your data set uh, for example in this case for a customer uh, retention telecom customer retention scenario we had some brilliant features for each of those features you can actually calculate the bias so well say one of the features is the gender of the customer now uh, when you put your model to production uh, with uh, this way so you specify the model config and again uh, create a baseline metric as you do with the case of data quality and model quality. Once you do that and launch a monitoring schedule uh, supported by a ground truth value, which will show whether your values are accurate or not, as was the case with model monitoring, you end up uh, with a violations report as was the case earlier. But the interesting thing here is uh, what this baseline, this bias analysis gives you is uh, much more than what you might be able to do if you were, to do, if you were just doing calculations masked from your side. For example, for this, uh, just for this case, I'm uh, uh, illustrating another scenario, again, a FinTech scenario, we are based on the uh, different attributes like gender, uh, number of working hours, uh, reason, and uh, kind of work people do. They, it's predicted whether they'll, they are earning more than 50K dollars per month or less than 50K dollars per month. And uh, what you see is something known as pre-training bias metric. It is essentially, the in this particular case, how your, uh, uh, data set is distributed by gender. So in this case, 67% of uh, around 67% of users or of people are, are males and around 32% are females. Now it calculates certain matrices like demographic disparity, class imbalance, uh, a difference in positive predictions, uh, Jensen Shannon divergence, pullback labor divergence and so on. And uh, why this is relevant. So it's like this to put it in a very concise way, just as an exa ex example. We all know that our models will give some uh, positive values. So they'll give some false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. But is it that for a particular kind of value, these results are different. So is it that for females, for example, you have more false positives than you have for males or for some other category. For example, if you are, if the feature for on which you are measuring bias is say the reason, is it that for uh, Europeans, the model will generate uh, more false positives or true positives vice versa for the United States or for Indians. So that kind of bias analysis is best done uh, with the help of bias monitor provided by SageMaker model monitor, where you calculate all these different kinds of matrices. And uh, uh, just to talk about one of them. So the first one, for example, you can calculate a difference in predict positive proportions in predicted labels, where you check the difference in proportion of positive predictions between the favored facet and the disfavored facet. So if the, your favorite facet is, uh, if you are doing bias monitoring by agenda and your favorite facet is males and the disfavored facet is females, then it will calculate the difference in proportion of positive predictions between uh, males and females. So essentially it's a good way of checking even if your model is biased against what it is biased. So you have different matrices available for the same. And the same can be done using uh, Workload orchestrator, where you create another kind of pipeline that bring your own model model bias uh, pipeline, where you specify again your ground truth, the frequency at which you want it to run. You specify the kind of problem you are working on, the binary classification problem, or multi classification problem, or regression problem, and launch via an API call to your uh, orchestrator. Next comes feature attribution reform monitoring, where again you capture data from your uh, SageMaker endpoint, create a shape line, a shape baseline for models in production. Uh, create a uh, monitoring job and then inspect the results. Now, this can be done again via using the SDK where you invoke the model explanatory monitor provided with the appropriate data set, uh, create a SHAP config, which I'll just come to, and then have a baseline generated by the model monitor, which is compared against uh, with uh, similar values uh, when the model is deployed in production, the real values. Now, what are these shapely values? 
the concept so essentially as Ablasha was mentioning your feature attribution drift is measuring uh, the relative change in contribution of different features to your model output uh, so as she was mentioning earlier on till 2016 it was the data rates which are prominent which are actually a more determinant factor of which customer which telecom operator you would go for you would prefer the telecom operator which would go give you the cheapest rates and data rates wouldn't actually matter they wouldn't be even that much different for different operators but now with the entry of geo that changed drastically and data rates really mattered now uh, how do we measure the contribution of different features to the model output? So this is done via Shapley using, in the case of SageMaker model monitor. Uh, this concept has been taken from game theory and it is deployed in machine learning context. It provides a way to quantify the contribution of each player to a game in the in game theory. Uh, it also shows you the means to distribute the total gain generated by a game uh, to players based on their contributions. And this machine learning con context SageMaker monitor and then clarify also as Vilasha was mentioning earlier, uh, treats the prediction of the model on a given instance as the game and the features included in the model as the players. And well, if you think intuitively, how do you want to, how you can calculate the contribution of each feature? One way is just take the marginal contribution or effect of each feature. So you just take your model, just put one feature, see how it varies. Drop some feature from your data set, see how the result varies. Drop another feature, see how the result varies. That is one way of doing it. But problem with this approach is it doesn't take into account the relative interaction between features because features are many a time not independent. There are non-linear relationships, both linear and non-linear relationships between features and you cannot do it. So uh, the means to distribute the total gain generated by a game to its players based on their contributions uh, uh, is something which we look for. And if two features are highly correlated, dropping either of them it might not alter the model prediction significantly. To address these potential dependencies, uh, the Shapley value requires that outcome of each possible combination of features must be considered to determine the importance of each feature. Uh, given some D features, there are some 2D possibly possible feature combinations, each corresponding to a potential model. And uh, to determine if uh, the attribution of a given feature, F, the marginal contribution of uh, including F in all feature combinations got to be considered. And uh, overall, the average need to be taken. And uh, as far as uh, this entire mathematical analysis is concerned, it has been shown rigorously, and there are papers for that, that shapey, shapey values are a good determinant of the same. So when you actually uh, launch your feature monitoring job, you have SageMaker model monitor uh, capturing uh, shapey values for you. And uh, you create a monitoring schedule to that effect, have the violations report created, and the same can be done using model uh, uh, workload orchestrator, MLOPS workload orchestrator, where you choose a uh, model explainability monitor pipeline, uh, provide the data set against which, uh, which is the baseline data set against which the results have to be captured, provide the kind of problem which you're interested in binary classification and provide uh, the baseline. And uh, 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 this will generate the respective pipeline for you. Now, just to conclude, uh, as we are anyway running out of time. Uh, so as Scott mentioned, initially model monitoring is quite critical. So today uh, and more so these days, is a time of volatility. So earlier on, it was COVID for the last two to three years. COVID actually played havoc, but now we have a volatile market for several reasons. And for that matter, well, life in general is dynamic. So uh, uh, it's human beings who make machine learning models, as uh, Scott talked about uh, the case where your faces are not detected. Uh, you got to, uh, we got to avoid those scenarios. So those models should actually be learning from our uh, lifestyle rather than we actually getting accustomed to that. We have different ways whereby we can manage, uh, we can actually monitor models. There, there is, there we can do a manual setup or we can have a managed service for it. So in this case, the managed service which we talked about was the SageMaker model monitor, which provides excellent monitoring features. Uh, again, uh, we can invoke the model monitor via the Python SDK, which provides us a well, uh, 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 a more configurable option in terms of, uh, well, if we want to uh, add specific kinds of uh, options to our code, we can do it and we can use it wherever we want. So the, the solutions implementation on the other hand is like uh, 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 an approach to get a pipeline of your choice. So if you are, for example, working in uh, working on SageMaker projects where you have a big uh, project where you are writing code for yourself, you would better go for Python SDK because you can customize and it will be integrated as part of the code. However, if all you want is to generate a model training pipeline, you don't have to actually uh, build an integrated system using code First, like, I only want a pipeline. Let's go for the workload orchestrator. Now, based on the results of the model uh, uh, monitoring, you got to take some actions. So uh, if it is a feature attribution, for example, there have been external factors which have caused some changes, your model got to be retrained. 
if you realize that the data which your model is receiving is actually not so good, there are statistical uh, violations, then maybe you've got to do an upstream filtering. So you got to look at your entire data pipeline. Maybe you got to remove the null values before the entire system and uh, ensure that your pipeline sends proper values to your model. So that's the entire thing. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Shubham. Uh, yes, I think we're almost out of time, but we can have a few questions. If there are, please do share them in the Q&A box or the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. All right, I suppose that's all that we have for today. So thank you once again, Scott, Abhilasha, and Shubham. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Seems we do have a question from Jish. Any lean practice? May explain what he means by lean practice? Yeah, would you elaborate on this a little bit, Jish? What, do you, what exactly are you looking for? <clears throat> If there are any other questions, please. Okay, lean as in not a detailed but minimal practices. Well, so when we talk about model monitoring uh, and doing that using SageMaker model monitor, it's a best practice and rather a lean practice in itself to use a model monitor. So uh, as I showed in my slides, you have multiple ways of doing it. If you actually want a very kind of lean solution where you don't have to specify, or you don't necessarily want to code it up, uh, you simply uh, uh, go for the workload orchestrator. So it will create all kinds of monitoring pipelines for you. You don't even need to actually uh, uh, run any Python notebook or SageMaker notebook or Studio notebook for that. All you need to do is to make an API call to an orchestrator which is deployed by you. And this will generate all kinds of pipelines. So in that sense, it's a very, uh, I would say, lean way of doing things. Vaisa is having all this done via the Python SDK. The Python SDK uh, would be better in scenarios where you are actually uh, working on a bigger product, which is quite customized for your use. So if you, for example, refer to our previous blogs and our previous webinars, we talk about difference between SageMaker pipelines and SageMaker projects and how they compare with, with uh, workload orchestrator. All that is described here. Uh, again, to precisely answer your question, uh, uh, the model monitor by itself, the workload uh, orchestrator implementation thereof is essentially a very lean practice. Great, thanks uh, Shubham. I'll just like to remind everyone that this session, this webinar is obviously being recorded. So we will be sharing the recording with everyone each and one of you as well as all those who have registered for this event and once again if you still have any questions please feel free to reach out uh, reach out to us on connect at walking tech or through our website uh are you answering this uh shubham sure, uh, Jish wants to know sure, sure, sure. sure i'll be taking this question so the question is can this be done uh, offline too now Again, it depends on the approach which you are following. So offline as in you are not connected to internet. If you have a different interpretation of the same, do let me know. So if you are running, for example, uh, the Python SageMaker uh, SDK, you would do it on SageMaker notebooks. So you would essentially be connected to SageMaker instances or SageMaker Studio instances uh, for the same which you will do online. On the other hand, if you, for example, uh, have uh, an entire end-to-end -end solution using the orchestrator, so the orchestrator can be controlled via uh, can be managed via again two options you have you can make api calls from the console for which you need to be connected naturally to the you need to be online and the other option is that uh, well uh, just that you don't need to do it through console you can do it through your uh, command line but essentially even for that you need to have a connection with your uh, instances and in cloud which are doing that so or if off, if by offline you mean you are not connected to the internet and you will be able to do it it's not that since it is an uh, AWS managed service, you got to be working with uh, AWS uh, either through your uh, command line or through the console and uh, the necessary connection should be there. 
right so thanks once again shubham and that will be all for today i hope uh, all of you have been enjoying uh, enjoying our sessions and find them useful we will be reaching out to you for more such live events on machine learning so watch out for this space and thank you once again and goodbye everyone thanks sir